Hello and welcome to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event. My name's Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director of Movers and Shakers. I hope you're having a really good week. So today is our second mini lecture in our series of mini lectures on global cities. And today's topic is London, the ever evolving city. A brief history of the dynamics and adaptive spatial, political and socio-economic responses of the capital. And we're delighted to welcome back to Movers and Shakers, Professor Tony Travers, who is cause, of course, Director of the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, the LSE. And he's also visiting professor for the Department of Government at the LSE. So welcome back, Tony. Thank you today for joining us. So Tony's going to do a, a brief lecture, as I said, he's going to be talking uh, about London, exploring the spatial, the social, the economic, the political changes that have occurred from the Victorian time of Charles Booth, when he first did his social mapping of London, looking at the changes through to today's uh, London borough led geography. Uh, he'll be looking at the challenges that London have faced over the years and how it's maintained its positioning on the global stage and with the neighbourhood led bottom up approach and what will be the impacts of the new and latest levelling up agenda for London and for the UK. So lots to talk about, really looking forward to the conversation with him. He'll be speaking for about 20 minutes and then we'll have time for some questions as usual. So please do think of some good questions for Tony and we'll make sure that we can ask as many as possible. Now, I know you're all watching once again uh, today's event on our platform or indeed maybe on our Movers and Shakers community app. We really hope that you're enjoying the experience. We've got lots of positive feedback. You're able to network 24-7 to make connections, to win business, etc. And we've had a lot of people feeding back that they've done just that. So that's really great. So do let us know when these things happen. It's, it's really great. And of course, all of our events are then put onto our on-demand area. So there's 52 plus hours of events for you guys to catch up on. Um, and also the opportunity to look at our knowledge hubs and to read the latest market insights. So please do enjoy. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Tony with his slides. Enjoy and remember to keep thinking of questions and networking as well. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Well, very good morning to you. Um, I'd like to thank Movers and Shakers for this opportunity to speak uh, once again at one of their excellent events. Uh, I've done them uh, in real life in the past uh, in front of many of you. Uh, and I look forward to doing that again at some point in the future. Right now we're getting back towards a kind of normal. Um, and what I want to do uh, today is to speak to this title, London, the ever, uh, the ever evolving city, but of course, against a backdrop of uh, the COVID pandemic, which has led us communicating in this particular way. Um, and also of other things that have happened in the recent period, which includes obviously Brexit, uh, with all the impact that that will have on London and the UK economy. And what I want to really to think about is how uh, London adapts and has survived. It has adapted and survived over the years. And I want to look, you know, obviously London used to be a much smaller place than it is today. And I'll talk a bit about that. But now we're looking at a significantly bigger uh, version of London. Uh, and so I want to consider not just central London, inner London, that would have been London of the past, but obviously the wider city, greater London, uh, and indeed beyond, in fact, as it is today. So if I can just get us going here. Now, uh, and this, this looks a bit bleak, but I promise you I'll, I'll move beyond this. I want to make the point that London as a massive city, always big in the context of the UK, um, has suffered an array of serious threats to it. And these threats are clearly worse for big cities, you know, not just for London, but Paris, New York, other cities that have suffered, perhaps not as far back in this case, in, in the case of New York, but certainly in Paris, the same kind of threats. And they're intensified because of the very scale and density of the city, making them not only appear worse, but actually be worse for those who live in them. And so the, the impact on a big city such as London, such as Paris, is clearly greater when these things happen than it would be if you're living in, in a house in the countryside, indeed, some of you may be watching this from a house in the countryside and you'll get the feeling and get what I mean. 
So if we look at uh, the Black Death, those you all remember from your history, you know, that there were Black Death episodes, frankly, can almost continuously on and off every five to 12 years from the 14th century all the way through to the end of the 15th century. And then in the 17th century, the Great Plague, which was the last major outbreak, which killed uh, about 100,000 people in London at the time. That's 25% of the city's population, just to put it in uh, co context. And what's interesting about that, by the way, is that the city of London um, indulged in early data collection of the kind we see on the TV every night uh, through bills of mortality, which required um, parish clerks to record the number of deaths uh, every day or every week, and then report them into the Guildhall, uh, creating a very early form of data collection, very effective, in fact. Um, then almost immediately after the Great Plague came the Great Fire. Now, amazingly, given how much of London as it then was, was destroyed, much of it actually, um, though in fact, there were only six deaths. It, it moved slowly enough for people to move, famously, um, Samuel Pepys burying a large Parmesan cheese to try to protect it as part of that exercise. And of course, uh, we know that after that, uh, efforts by King Charles II and Sir Christopher Wren to rebuild the city in a sort of more splendid way with avenues and straight streets was completely overwhelmed by city merchants who just got back to building their houses on the same street pattern uh, in a broadly similar way. Cholera became a problem in the 19th century. There were major outbreaks between the 1830s and the 1860s, uh, generally killing 10 to 20,000 people each time. And of course it was these cholera outbreaks more than anything that led to parliament creating the Metropolitan Board of Works, which built London's sewage sewer system, Sir Joseph Bazalgette and all of that. And indeed, uh, the embankments, a number of straight streets, and it was the basis of a major improvement in public health. Moving forward to the 20th century, two major incidents, but particularly the second of them, the World Wars, World War One and World War Two. Scale of death, uh, relatively to some of these earlier things, was smaller, though you know, 20,000 civilians died in London uh, during the Blitz in a fairly short period as uh, bombs rained down on the city. So again, and, and what these, all of these incidents um, have in common, of course, is that they're a major threat to the city and its people. Slightly lesser way, though, at the time, those of you who were there, who were in London, and many of us were, terrorism, which has been a feature of London from the 1860s onwards, with a number of causes, some of which are still present in, in society today. But these have generated attacks on places and people, uh, creating fear and on occasion uh, killing people besides. So all that, the point I'm making here is that big cities inevitably attract bad things from time to time, or at least they exaggerate the effect of, um, of illnesses, plagues, epidemics, fires, whatever, beyond what would be the case in a village in the countryside. I couldn't resist using this matte cartoon which appeared uh, at one, one point last year in the Daily Telegraph, um, uh, capturing the sense that perhaps the great fire which occurred after that plague was somehow a roadmap out of it, but let's pass swiftly on. So the crucial thing is that the city, London, has recovered from all of these, and indeed, despite all of them, has grown to be one of the world's most remarkable and in, um, in some ways ad admired cities. Now, of course, these kind of events uh, were often, uh, they led to temporary population loss and serious negative impacts on business, the arts and culture and social life. So almost in every single one of these events, those with second homes or who had the opportunity left for the countryside. This is a phenomenon that repeats itself every time. So with the pandemic uh, last March, April, May, lots of people left uh, London and other cities around the world, Paris, New York, to escape the threats that by implication we're discussing here. But this is not new. And that temporary population loss 
and the serious negative impacts that that had on business as businesses shut down. Anybody who's been into the West End during the pandemic will know that the West End and the city have been almost entirely empty, although some of the outer parts of the city, when there hasn't been such a tough lockdown, actually have been quite busy and have captured activity uh, away from the city centre. So central business district activity, the arts and culture, transport, and in Indeed, social life in the central area have all been, throughout history, whenever these events have happened, badly affected. So in addition to the people leaving, though many of them to come back, I mean, after the Second World War, uh, developers in London had uh, quite a busy time because of temporary departures of people and businesses and then temporary changes to uh, the use of property, there was quite a big uh, development surge after the Second World War into the 1950s as properties were repurposed and businesses returned uh, and the development industry in London was much involved in that. Another thing that happened after many of these events is rising wages because there were labour shortages. Now I was writing this slide two days ago before the inflation figures for yesterday were published but um, there's no doubt that uh, shortage of labour in the hospitality industry, which has already been discussed, which uh, may have something to do with people having left because of the pandemic, probably has something to do with the new migration rules post the final stages of Brexit. There may well be labour labor shortages. I think we will see some increase in wages in London, which may produce more labour coming in from the rest of the UK, as has happened in the past. Uh, so rising wages and inflation were common impacts following the relevant major incident of the kind that I was listing earlier. The other thing that happened, good for the development industry, is extensive rebuilding and the creation of new enterprises. And I've often thought about after the pandemic, which has undoubtedly had a profound effect on inner and central London, um, that rather like, like um, TV documentaries about a terrible forest fire that destroyed is a great chunk of Australia, for example. And then, you know, a year later, a film crew goes back, looks at um, the same place and finds that trees have sprouted, new animals have appeared, and the whole place has come back to life. And I suspect there'll be a certain amount of that. And having been out and about in the city centre throughout the pandemic, um, there's no doubt that now massive amounts of uh, refurbishment, new businesses are opening, lots and lots of um, uh, new shops and offices, so shops, offices and indeed restaurants look to me as if they're beginning to about to open. And I'd expect to see a great deal more of that, possibly on a slightly lower cost structure, but then for creating a whole range of new businesses to replace those uh, particularly in the retail sector which have disappeared. And of course, the other thing to note about all of this is we don't really know the time scale. I was listening, and many of you may have heard him, to Robert De Niro on uh, the radio yesterday morning about talking about exactly this process in New York City. And he made the point, I don't know how long it will take, but New York will come back. And I think that's true. We shouldn't pretend that all of this recovery will occur in the short, shorter period as the damage has taken place. I mean, it could take several years. And certainly after the Second World War, many of you in the development industry who have been in the industry for a long time will know, you know, there were still bomb sites in central London till relatively recently, and one or two very, very recently. So some of this recovery could take a number of years. I'm not saying it'll take as long as recovery from the Second World War, but it could take some time to get back to normal. And normal may, of course, be slightly different. And this is just to make the point which I've sort of in elliptically referred to on a couple of occasions already about London's spectacular growth. This comes from an excellent website which I've sourced here because uh, whoever drew these lovely maps deserves the credit, showing how between you know, the end of the 18th century when the city was little more than the city of London and Westminster and the little area around it, how fast it grew uh, outwards to, towards uh, what is today Greater London, and in fact even these uh, maps don't really uh, do the scale of the urban uh, sprawl um, credit, because it goes beyond this which is the London boundary, 
But you can see the amazing leap, the one that always fascinates me most, between 1920 and 1940, when effectively um, the size of London's built up area doubled uh, in a very, very short time. And anybody who knows outer London well will know how much of outer London was built in this period. Then, of course, hemmed in by the green belt, of which more in a second. So this chart uh, kind of shows a, a phenomenon which is, I'll come back to this chart, I'm going to use it twice. So the um, first line to look at is the inner London, the blue line, which shows how inner London's population, that's the 12 inner London boroughs and the city of London, that its population maxed out around the beginning of the 20th century. It, it reached its maximum of 5 million, a lot of that because of overcrowding. We're talking about overcrowded housing in the East End rather than um, upstairs, downstairs type um, inhabitation of homes uh, in the square, in Eaton Square and elsewhere in southwest London, in inner southwest London. In fact, the city of London's population probably reached its maximum in the 1850s. So a long decline, so from five million to two and a half million, and it's come back a bit since then. We then look at um, outer London, which is the sort of uh, orangey line, brown, orange, whatever color it is, um, rising almost continuously till the, uh, until the um, 1950s, levelling off, falling a bit, but nothing like what happened in inner London. And then, of course, uh, we've got two other lines, the inner ex-urban rings. So this is just outside the Green Belt, showing how when the Green Belt was instituted in the 30s, how it pushed growth over the Green Belt out into uh, an area which is really the sort of the, the counties just outside London. It's worth noting that of all the people who leave London to live in the rest of the country every year, almost 80% of them go to this area. And then beyond that, what the drawers of this chart call the outer ex-urban ring, uh, I know we know what they mean, which is the area beyond that. We're now talking about the far edges of the wider southeast. So this would be in places such as Norfolk, um, and uh, you know, in the, in the South Midlands, more or less, and Swindon, places such as that. And that area has continued to grow throughout. Now, the reason that this matters, of course, is I think this tells us something, not only about very long-term trends, but what might happen next, but I'll come back to that. So we've seen London grow outwards, huge growth spurts between 1800 and 1900. And then this very, very intriguingly large one when farmers were selling off fields at scale um, to developers between 1918 and 1939. So over time, the centre and then inner London have seen population declines and lower densities. And this is as railways and roads allowed the creation of what were called suburbs, allowing people to enjoy the benefits of a city salary, but whilst living in Pinner or living in Carshalton. Um, railways allowed all of that. And of course, then beyond the suburbs of the greater London area, what you might call satellite towns and villages, which you know can go out as far as north of Cambridge, north of Oxford and down to the south coast. The Green Belt, which I touched on a moment ago, which was in imposed in the late 30s, more or less where London on those maps we were looking at earlier uh, ends today, the Green Belt created both pressure to leap over it and after 1985 to redevelop ex-industrial land and buildings in inner and central London and anybody walking through uh, or developing in inner and central London will know this, that many of the new developments of apartments um, and indeed you know, uh, some new retail has been on land that used to be industrial and has been turned into huge areas of new flats. And these in turn have helped drive up the population of inner London. So the green belt in part stops London sprawling out over green land, but in part pushes development back in one way and out to satellite areas uh, on the other. And so we've seen, you know, slum areas or what were slum areas, uh, maybe described as slums, words we really use these days, have become upmarket shopping districts and music halls have become opera houses and you can choose your own. Um, one thing became the other to fit 
Um, and I just thought when I was preparing this uh, presentation, the one intriguing thing about this is how Georgian houses, and I'm sitting in a Georgian house here today, are remarkable survivors through all of this and are now almost 100% uh, protected. So I just thought I'd um, demonstrate this with a couple of images that many of us will know. Um, on the um, left here, we've got a drawing of the parish, a street in the parish of St Giles. And it, it, you can see this is going south from uh, Seven Dials. Looks like St Martin in the Fields uh, at the, in the distance here. Um, and so I've taken a, an, a Google Street View shot of it today. Uh, this area around St Giles famously uh, immortalized and not in a good way by Hogarth, Gin Lane and all of that. You know, the parish of St Giles with its nests of close and narrow alleys and courts has passed as, a by, as into a byword as the synonym of filth and squalor. This is the same area which is described by Capco today as Covent Garden is a leading global retail and dining destination in the heart of London. Covent Garden has been transformed, transformed into a world-class district for brands consistently, consistently welcoming over 40 million visits a year. And it just shows you how the place can change now, over quite a long period, not that long actually, we're talking about the beginning of the 19th century and the early part of the 21st century here. Um, no prizes, by the way, for the utilities of dug, who dug up the street on this uh, picture on the right. And uh, even more short term, I mean, this is within my working lifetime. Uh, so there is Canary Wharf in 1982. You can just see NatWest Tower, Tower 42, and the city's micro cluster as it then was uh, at the time. And what is there from a different angle, it must be said, um, not quite the same angle, looking to the other side. Uh, I think today, actually it might be, no, it is from the other side. Anyway, the point is, um, this is an incredibly swift uh, period of change, turning what was a derelict dock area into uh, what is effectively looks like an entirely new city. Um, well, it is an entirely new city within uh, 40 years, in fact, rather less. Now, um, I'm actually sitting in a room with a Booth poverty map on the wall behind me. Uh, the LSE um, owns the copyright to the Booth's poverty maps. And I've just taken a little section, the same St Giles Covent Garden section here. Um, and Booth was an early social scientist, walked the streets using data to categorize the streets of London. I think these are beautiful pieces of art myself, in addition to being uh, a very good piece of precise um, science, you know, social science. And although that some of the terms used to describe uh, the people are probably not um, fit, not quite fit with contemporary uh, world views and how we describe people, uh, you can see that from the sort of yellow, red and pink uh, areas where the upper middle and upper middle classes and wealthy lived, all the way through to the uh, areas that are dark shaded, where poorer people lived, you get a real sense of what London was like, and particularly down the south where the LSE happens to be today, was an area of intense poverty and rookeries. And yet, intriguingly, uh, Spencer Percival, the only prime minister to be assassinated, actually lived in a house in Lincoln's Inn Fields. So even as today, rich and poor were very closely, at, you know, they were living quite close together, uh, a facet of London's development which remains true. So what that, um, Booth's map tells us about St Giles and Covent Garden, but it could have been other parts of the city, is that there's still today a mixture of affluent houses, some of which are now offices, and blocks of social housing all tangled in together, including, if you go back to um, the, some of the areas shaded dark on this, you'll find if you go there this afternoon, or next time you're in the area, actually blocks of social housing and hostels in exactly the same places. The people who have gone are the fairly comfortable good ordinary earnings, which is what academics probably um, like to think they, uh, they are. Um, you know, that sort of middle, middle class have gone. Um, they just can't afford to be here. The rich can afford to live here, relatively affluent, and the very poor in social housing, there's a fair amount of that in this area, they can afford to live here, but others find it harder now. 
as I said, streets where there were slums were often replaced by Peabody or other charitable housing and then eventually social housing blocks. And I say, if you look at this area in Covent Garden, you can see these cheek by jowl Peabody blocks and the Royal, and, and the Royal Opera House and the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, all in the same tiny area. So this pattern of mixed types of household and income as observed by Booth during the 19th century and other social reformers at the time, remains highly predictive of affluent and deprived areas today. Indeed, a study done by the University of Leeds in the 1990s showed how the Booth poverty maps were a very good predictor, even today, of affluence and poverty. And just to make this point even more so, look at, these are the poverty maps for Bethnal Green on the one side and Mayfair on the other. Now, of course, Bethnal Green is rather a, a, a much more affluent and uh, slightly fashionable these days. Mayfair <clears throat> remains as it was. So it's interesting how much of these, how much history creates this future for us. It is, to use a term academics like to use, path dependent, history is so much path dependent. So if we look ahead, just to conclude, what about the impact of COVID-19 and other factors that have rained down on London in the last uh, year, but actually three, four, five years? Well, in many ways, <clears throat> certainly the scale of COVID-19 is similar to plagues, fires and wars. In fact, nothing has happened to London uh, quite on the scale of COVID-19 since the Second World War. There's been an, in, an initial exodus of people. We don't know how many people. Um, probably two or three hundred thousand, could be more. Some people think it's more, have left. Some will return, and there's likely then to be resurgence, but then there will be changes. Um, and this is where I'm going off from a bit of history into speculation. Um, these might include, I stress might, and we can discuss this, a possible moderate and permanent shift of property owning Londoners from inner London to outer London and the area outside. So that, that seem, you know, state agents are telling us that that is happening. Prices may indicate it. I have colleagues who are less certain, to be honest, but those on this call probably know much more about this, will know much more about this than I do. Um, there are clearly lower rents and house price, prices in inner London, particularly the rents have fallen substantially. That ought to attract more younger and more innovative people. I think we will see a return to partial and then fuller usage, particularly from September. I think when some sort of a new uh, business year uh, uh, begins and everything is as normal as it's going to be, we hope. Um, and then of course, partly because of Brexit, nothing to do with COVID, we will see a switch from lower income EU migrants uh, in Britain to more migrants from the rest of the world and possibly more complicatedly from the rest of the United Kingdom. And of course, separately, uh, these are not low income migrants, but there will be an impact from people arriving from Hong Kong, possibly a substantial number, which could have a significant impact, in my view, on uh, the London economy in a positive way. So. Just to conclude, what I think, therefore, is going to come out of this particular uh, period of change, this impact on London, is a series of changes which will expand London, in inverted commas, the, the city, but you know, not just within the administrative boundaries, wider into the southeast, which will actually, in the medium term, create an even larger version of itself. That is, London will become an even bigger city over time, allowing some reuse of the inner and central area, but overall a kind of sp further spreading out of London to become an even bigger city. So this is going back to that chart I was looking at earlier, because that's the established pattern. So it would simply take us potentially, I'm not, nothing like as extremely as this, but back into that kind of uh, pattern, creating an even bigger London. And it's easily done. Here is the um, rail system. This is not the tube. The tube and all the within London rail systems are in that little shaded box in the middle, which has got a yellow colour. This is looking at the rail network beyond that. So actually, there's already a rail network that precisely facilitates. Uh, it's interesting. This is all in the news this morning about the future of the railways. Um, but this, you know, it's not as if we'd have to build railways to facilitate what I've just discussed. It's what uh, already exists. So uh, thank you very much. I will now stop sharing my screen and hand back to Natasha.
Have I done that properly? Yes, it's all good. Tony, that was superb. I knew it would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much indeed. And I've got a few questions and I know there's a few that's been coming in from the audience. I'm actually fascinated um, when you look at that expansion model there, you know, how far in the next 20, 40, 60 years is London going to, do you think, going to actually expand? And, you know, is it going to be greater, greater London? You know, how's it going to be, you know, devised? And, and will that dilute the, the sort of premiership of, of London as a capital? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, like all futurology, it's a hostage. By answer, it's going to be a hostage to fortune. I mean, I think central London, which is a, a, a very complex ecosystem and very important to some industries, not least of which are the theatre and creative industries, um, the rail and transport industries, um, and obviously the property industry. I think it will recover. It may take some time fully to recover, but I just think, I think it will because in a sense, it was always the part of the United Kingdom. And it's true of central Manchester and Leeds to some degree, which had on offer all the things people want as they become more affluent and society and the economy changes in the way it has been really for decades. So I think, I think it will uh, recover. Um, but you know the the ever onwards growth of London. I mean, this that this wider London, including much of the inner southeast, depending on how you look at it, is a city of fifteen to twenty million, twenty two million people. Now, I think a big question begged by this is what happens to the green belt? There's already a sort of culture war going on about the green belt, and that I have colleagues certainly who believe that for grounds of social equity. And if you read my great, my great and good colleague Paul Cheshire's work on this, he thinks that we should build in more of the green belt and effectively expand London, not, not all of it, but some of it, in order to create um, more housing more equitably for people who currently can't afford it. And it is the case that people on median incomes in London can never afford to buy a house or a flat. They never afford to buy a home, even in you know, outer London these days, it's almost impossible. So I think we'll see a debate, about, a debate about the green belt and also potentially about, you know, whether some of the working from home and um, new patterns of the economy and developers on this, uh, this event will have a view about this, um, you know, whether some outer London centres can develop more. Remember Croydon, after all, developed very fast because in part of the uh, George Brown office ban or the office ban that was instituted in the 1960s, uh, which had all sorts of distortionary impacts, both in central London and in places such as Croydon and beyond. So I think we will see a slight shifting of economic activity around the city, possibly more outer centres and more people living outside. But then I do think that we will see many new businesses with a younger population in the middle. So it might not be quite as rich and as high a GDP as it was, but it may become more creative, more interesting. And I really think from the developer point of view, providing the facilities and the space for people to try out businesses is going to become a very important thing because I just think there will be more of them who were previously priced out who might now be able to afford to be here. So, um, it's a complex dynamic, you know, almost feel you yeah. need a model to explain this. But that's what I think might happen. And I think it's interesting. We've got a question come in. I was going to ask something similar. Um, is the Authority of London in the context of the UK under threat from the levelling up agenda? So, yeah, the impact of kind of this, this levelling up agenda coming right to the focus at the moment, what's that going to do to London? Well, it's interesting. Levelling up, you know, if, if you follow the logic of the words levelling up, that would mean London would continue to be London and with its economic output and the rest of the country would be encouraged to catch up. Now, this is you know, easier to say than do. We're, we're talking about here patterns that have been in place in some ways for 100 years. As I would say, the Jarrow March, March South. And that was a long, long time ago, a century ago, really now. So against that backdrop, I think there is a risk that levelling down proves difficult and politicians then think levelling, sorry, levelling up proves difficult and therefore levelling down might be easier. And that would be very bad, partly because actually there are plenty of places and households and people in London who themselves need levelling up help. You know, um, 
redistributing resources and um, public investment and so on and jobs from Barking and Dagenham to the richer parts of Yorkshire doesn't sound as if it makes much of a sense, make, makes much sense to me. So uh, I think we need to keep a beady eye on what levelling up really means. I mean, you know, some civil service jobs are moving out of London uh, to the West Midlands, to the North East, some more announced yesterday to go to Stoke-on-Trent. Now, it's worth noting that since Brexit, the civil service has grown enormously. And actually, I suspect that even after these people, these jobs have left, there'll still be more civil servants in London than there were before, uh, there were in 2016. Um, more to the point, as I was walking along Whitehall recently, I noticed that the former government office buildings had been turned into a splendid new five, possibly six star hotel. Uh, very nice it will be too. So, you know, th there are opportunities from using office buildings for other purposes that could drive up value and GDP. So I think what London needs to do is to be flexible in lobbying to ensure there isn't any levelling down, but separately to take advantage of, you know, if civil servants are moved to other parts of the country, great, then let's use those spaces for new fun, predict, you know, more economically productive purposes and the development industry is well placed to do that. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to try and whisk through a couple of these last questions here. This is a good one. Do you think that lo the local government structure of London is fit for purpose? The GLA has been in place for 21 years. Interestingly, the GLC lasted for the same period. Are we due for a change? Well, uh, what, what an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, everything that I've been saying about this wider stretch of London. As, to some extent, it's been true for a very long time. My colleagues who are economic geographers never really saw the greater London boundary as the economic geography, uh, the boundary of the economic geography of London. You know, the economic geography of London is definitely tied up with and vice versa, the economy of Reading or the economy of Brighton or Bournemouth even, and the economy of Milton Keynes and um, Colchester and you know a whole range of places and further beyond that too. So whether that might require a revisiting of you know where London is and how it's governed is I think you know it's, it's a, a, an open question whether London needs to be expanded at some point. The problem with that is and anybody watching this from you know just outside London will know people who are in Surrey or um, Kent often don't want to be moved into London. Um, you know, they like to think of themselves as being in the county outside. So there would be, and there always is, a certain amount of opposition, but I think that subject might need to be revisited. Certainly, if more of the economic activity visibly is spread further out, and so that central London and this broader London catchment area are more tied together even than they were in the past. So I think the main, this may need to be revisited, yeah. OK, and I think just to mention climate change, because we haven't talked about that and, you know, sustainability, uh, net zero carbon, all the big ambitions there, which seems to be only going in one direction and becoming more and more important to us. So, you know, there's been lots of studies done, the, the Paris 15 minute city, there's the walkability study that's been done by Knight Frank recently. Um, and the idea that, you know, we all need to be walking more, cycling more, not using our cars, obviously, because of carbon emissions. Um, for our health and well-being, and that, that we should have these community areas where we're able to walk, you know, 15 minutes to get to where we want to work, where we want to shop, you know, how will that affect London if we actually go for that, or how far will we go for that? Well, I'm personally uh, very, um, I wouldn't say uneasy is quite the word, I'm, I'm perfectly at ease with, you know, uh, proper sensible policies in relation to climate change and sustainability, and also in encouraging walking and cycling a bit less so with the 15 minute city. Um, and the reason for that is the inner area of London around the central business district is significantly less densely populated than the equivalent areas of Paris or New York. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the idea that um, they would become, uh, you know, that if everybody, if everybody followed the logic of the 15 minute city, um, I think you get quite a lot of sprawl myself because everybody be, you know, living and working across a much wider area than they do now. Not very good for the core of the city. And I think that, and there's some very good maps in a report done by Arab uh, for the uh, Mayor of London, for the Greater London Authority, which demonstrate 
this point. So I think we have to be a bit careful with the 15 minute city because you remember that though we, we may not get back to commuting on the scale it was uh, in February last year, there were one and a half million people a day commuting in and out of central London. Um, and if you only had people who were traveling 15 minutes into central London, it would be a very, very, very different place with a very, very, very different economy. So, and, and of course, the other thing implied in what I was saying earlier about the possibility that economic activity might move slightly outwards from inner and central London is that the further you get from inner and central London, the more people drive cars. And the great thing about central London in its previous and existing form is that it effectively forced people to use public transport in order to earn what were actually on average for most people really quite high uh, incomes. So you created very high levels of economic output with very, very few cars being used. And so if, if economic activity is allowed to sprawl too much, it will become a car based rather than the public transport based economy. And, uh, you know, I've spoken elsewhere about the risk of what you might call Los Angelesification of London. And London has always been a bit, has elements of Los Angeles about it and elements of a more densely populated city like Paris or New York. And uh, we have to be careful, I think, not accidentally to say through 15 minute city policies and working from home policies and all of this stuff, that in the end, more people end up being effectively forced to use cars and finding it easy to avoid using public transport. So I do think these things are, they have to be thought about in a kind of, um, they have to be thought about in the way, in a way that takes account of climate change and sustainability and make sure we don't accidentally deliver changes to the economy that undermine the good efforts of, you know, all that public transport building that we've done. Crossrail still to open, by the way. Um, so, um, so that's what I think I think about. But I think that. also when you look at things like livability, there's been, you know, so many changes in, in people's needs, um, focusing on their livability, on their mental health, on what, you know, what they want out of life. I think whether these changes, these changes that come in cycles, like you said, to, to, you know, the plagues, the other epidemics, you know, yes, things come back again. But at the moment, I think lots of people have got a strong desire to be outside of central London, to be able to have that flexibility to work from home, even, you know, smaller local offices opening, you know, the demise of maybe the high street, uh, bringing back mixed use. I think, you know, inevitably, there's going to be this short term effect, however, it pans out long term, you know, I, I, I can't see it not happening myself. But you know, I don't study these things. Well, no, 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 and in fairness, nobody knows, nobody knows. But what I do say though, is that um, politicians at the borough, city hall and national level have the power to, to, to determine this stuff. And, you know, it's worth making this point that mm. you know, we've had a, a, a year and a quarter now of messaging, which is still going on, which boils down to try and work at home. Yeah. Now, it would be open to the government to reverse that messaging and try to encourage people to go back to work. And I, from what I read in the press, it sounds to me as if that's what Boris Johnson would like to do. But the messaging, and not only on this subject, is a bit kind of hard to understand. Um, so I think that, you know, if, uh, what politicians have to think through is if they do say, well, we accept working from home and the government's introducing these new flexible season tickets and more people can work at home. There are going to be consequences of that. And let's think about what some of them might be, because if the ecosystem of the city centre is um, radically altered. So, for example, the theatre and music industry would be very small, much smaller. Because, you know, the West End relies on a mixture of tourism, people coming in, from the rest of the country and people who live in central London. And I just think if, if central London is, uh, has fewer office workers, less economic activity, then over time, there'll be fewer restaurants, fewer people going to the theater and, 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 and that would simply shrink it. Now that has profound implications for the UK's soft power. Mm. You know, will, will Paris, I doubt that, you know, the Paris is opening new galleries at the moment. They've got a major new project to redo the Champs-Élysées. So, so would the French allow Paris to decline and to become a less splendid uh, manifestation of France? I doubt it. 
So uh, there's something there's something for the UK government to think about this, which is, do they want London to continue to be, and it's particularly its centre now, and we must become central London centric, but the truth is, <laughs> most people in Britain, and most people in London, most people in Britain, most people in the world, central London is a common agreed worldview of what London is. It isn't, it's a tiny part of London, it's 5% of it, but it's, and if, if that were not fully to recover, then other cities in the world would undoubtedly fully recover. Uh, you know, there are whole urban systems in Eastern uh, East Asia, which are developing around big cities. So I think we have to think about, do we want to have London recovering as a matter of soft power and, uh, you know, Britain's world reach? Because I think that there's more to it than just, you know, letting things happen and see what happens. And so that's why, you know, one interesting thing for me is going to be what the government as an employer tells its civil servants. Are they going to say you can all work at home forever? In which case, I'm not sure how you can move civil servants to uh, Wolverhampton and Stoke-on-Trent because frankly, they don't work anywhere. They didn't live, they just, they just, they're just like this. So, uh, you know, there's lots of things to be thought through. And as you know, uh, this morning's conversation is the beginning of thinking it through. I don't detect, I'm afraid, much thought of this kind going on inside government, particularly, uh, you know, what, what they want and whether they can deliver it. We can get people to work at home and have a lockdown. Do we want to do the opposite? And if so, how would we do that? Mm. Well, I think there's big there's big questions to be thought through. And I let's see what government does and let's see what, you know, people do across the UK because, you know, they have to be happy. We've been through this pandemic for what, almost 18 months now. So they've got to be happy with where they're going in the future and will drive, you know, what happens as well. So no, it's absolutely fascinating and lots more to talk about. We could go on all day. I know we're over time, Tony. So we're going to have to say thank you very much. And I know there's more questions, so I might send a few through to you if that's OK afterwards. And we'll see if we can post some answers sure, unless sure. there's anything you want to quickly jump on now. We've got literally probably a minute if we go over. Well, um, Farah's asked the question about, um, you know, the mayor's outer London focus. And I do think this is a good question because outer London has probably benefited from all the working at home. I went out yeah. in last summer, you know, in some parts of outer London and they were booming. And I think that is something to build on. I mean, I think it does help some of the retail areas and some of the, um, you know, the town centres in outer London uh, have benefited from this. Um, and, you know, there's not a fixed pot of growth. There's no reason why outer London shouldn't retain some of that, while central London can attract people from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, potentially, uh, to reassert itself. So there may be an opportunity in all of this to think more about outer London and in a way that's complementary. And that's why, you know, complementary to inner and central London. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's, again, an argument for, and I don't believe in government can do everything, but it can at least begin to articulate a debate and they make policy decisions about things like transport development and fares and the patterns of service and what messages the government sends out that then achieve the outcome. Government does have it's delivered a big change in our lives in the last year. It could deliver a big change the other way or another way if it chose to. Yeah, and levelling up, it's not just about levelling up across the UK, it's about levelling up across London as well, you know, and Absolutely. we need to, you know, that's, I think that's a really important point. It's been absolutely fantastic, Tony, thank you so much. And, you know, as I say, this will be on demand afterwards, so people can rewatch it. And, you know, we'll definitely forward the rest of the questions. And let's see, we get to that's absolutely brilliant morning. Great way to start the day. Thank you so much. Thank you to our right. audience. Um, thank you for sending in the questions, as we said, you know, it's been great. Uh, our next event will be May the 27th and we've got an event on a major regeneration lessons from the front line sponsored by Terence O'Rourke. Uh, after that, June the 9th, we've got our event on the creative estuary uh, and co-location and culturally led regeneration, which is going to be fascinating. Lots to look forward to. Please do stay on the platform, on the app, carry on networking, make connections look at our previous events. And if any of our members want to submit any articles or reports for our Market Insights Hub, we can add them to the community platform and alert members that they're on there. It's a good way to showcase your brand and for us all to keep in the loop with what everybody's doing and share good practice. So thank you very much indeed to all of you. Have a good day from our families to yours. Thank you.